Obviously, back then, he just told me to focus on growth curves and not answer, and ask such questions. But the reality is, dormancy, even back then, was uh, considered. And back in the 80s, it was all through L forms, you know, basically these bacteria without cell walls, which were very resistant to antibiotics, very resistant to thermal processing. And then, obviously, the VBNC came on, viable but not culturable, and that kind of dominated uh, the 80s and 90s. And then persisters, the persisters have been around, but food microbiologists didn't really consider them. You know, I remember being uh, in an IFP uh, meeting, I think it was 2015, that had literally a session on persisters in one uh, sort of room, and direct opposite room was VBNC. There's scheduling for you, isn't it? So people are interested in persisters, and the reality is, the big question, uh, debate, is what is the difference between persisters and VBNC? And I know food microbiologists don't get excited and confrontational, but once you get into this arena of persister versus VBNC, it gets pretty heated, you know, and uh, it's all down to perspectives, and we'll see how it goes. So what I'm hoping to do, I don't need to talk about persist how persisters are formed, uh, but I will do, and it's just a different way of looking at it, and I'm going to talk about it on a physiological role. Genetics people will talk to you about genes and all this kind of thing, toxin, antitoxin. But I'm going to try and keep it fairly high level and just try and sort this question out. VBNC versus persisters. So as you um, heard from the previous speakers, you know, what is the relevance of all this? Does it really matter? Is it just a curiosity? Well, the reality is we look at a lot of interventions and I know people say, well, we've got a two log reduction, five log reduction. But it never takes into account the residual. So bacteriophage, everyone says, yeah, we get residual populations, but don't worry about them. In thermal processing, again, we get residuals, don't worry about that. UV treatment, notorious, uh, but shading, I guess, is uh, responsible for that. But even high-pressure processing, you know, um, I know a lot of processors who adopted the technology, thinking it uh, will pasteurize the product, which it probably does, but they got residual listeria in their ham products. So these residual populations, and when we're doing diagnostics, we all know, don't we, we've done molecular works where they uh, do a PCR method and try to culture the actual uh, pathogen and they can't culture it and say, well, you know, is that a false negative or is that a false positive? So it all has very significant. So when we look at a brief history of dormancy, obviously... Before uh, Pasteur and the germ fairy came along, it was spontaneous, you know, and uh, that comes le <laughs> relevant later on. But obviously the germ fairy led on to Robert Koch, who did the postulates, and they said a viable cell is one that grows. And 160 years later, he's still right. And then obviously Fleming discovered or isolated penicillium, and it wasn't too long after that that uh, Bigger Stewart said, well, it's antibiotics, there are survivors to it and they persist. We can't sterilize it. And so that kind of really went into the realm of medical microbiology, these latent infections. And obviously, uh, Rita Carswell, I think she was from Cornell, if I remember right, or could be wrong, she discovered the VBNC, the viable non-culturable, especially in Vibrio. These are bacteria that are viable, they'll cause infection, but you can't culture them on, back to, on uh, plates or traditional plates. And then we have Tom Wood. The reason why I like Tom Wood is one of those people who spends more time disproving other researchers than he does proving his research. And you just look back at his papers, he's got outrageous kind of... He doesn't hold back. I've never met him, but I'm corresponding. He doesn't hold back. But he had one of the best opening statements of any paper. Most bacterial cells leave lives of quiet desperation in biofilms, combating stress and pre uh, prevalence uh, attest to their ability to alter gene regulation to cope with a myriad of insults. Very poetic. But what it's really saying is that there's more than one way microbes survive, and persistent state is one of them. So when we look at survival, then, we can look at the population level, both forming biofilms, their uh, stress response, uh, maybe that's the time to invade. But on an individual level, what we have are these different forms of what I call dormancy, the L forms, as I mentioned, these cell wallless uh, bacteria that grow slowly, very tolerant to thermal stress and things like that. 
Then the VBNC, which is differentiated from persistence, say, well, these are bacteria that's just beaten up so much that they can't grow anymore, but they're still viable. And then the persister, you know, back to 1944, these are the populations that resist the antibiotic challenge. So we don't need to know that much about why there is persisters and VBNC. It's obvious it's a hedge pressing. You know, there's no population that's homogeneous. You'll always have a subpopulation that holds back to when troubles arrive. And obviously, it does promote long-term survival because uh, most bacteria don't live in labs. Most bacteria live in the environment, which isn't a pleasant place, as you probably uh, realize. And essentially, what some people believe, it's uh, basically buying time to get antibiotic resistance, which I like that theory because it's true. They're trying to stave off until it... Or maybe it's just natural variation. Maybe some cells are born into dormancy, uh, the dud cells, but we'll see. All right, so I won't spend too much, but basically the way the science developed is the persisters are the clinical regions, you know, the clinic latent infections. They appear spontaneously in a population, again, contentious. The non-growing, low metabolic activity, and they survive antibiotic challenge by virtue of uh, not, being, uh, not growing. And they can revive, you know, uh, just by taking the stress away, the antibiotic stress, and we'll come back to that. Whereas the VBNC are beaten up cells, they've got to a point where they can't grow. They can potentially grow, but you need special reagent or special agents. The residual subpopulation, and you need special factors to revive. That's what VBNC is, and everyone said, wow, that's good, isn't it? So the thing about persisters is that it's a very, and I'm sure when uh, bigger developed the theory about persisters. Uh, there was no theory, there's no biomarkers there. We don't know if a strain's going to be persistent. We don't know if a cell's going to be a persister. And so what you get is that uh, food microbiologists uh, are like two things, like it cheap and quick. So the cheap thing and the quick thing is, let's get an overnight culture and grow it up. We'll use those as persisters. But the problem is, when you get to the stationary phase, you've got a mixed bag. You've got VBNC, lo low-growing cells, but when you go to type 2 persisters, they're actually the spontaneous ones. They're that appears in the exponential phase of growth. So I call those the true persisters. I'll probably get heckled in a minute, but we'll go with true persisters. We use type 2, whereas everyone else in the world uses type 1. Well, kind of. So as I mentioned to you, in the stationary phase, you have this sort of mixture. You get some resistance, obviously, if you've got the gene. Uh, you get tolerance one that can just hang on in there. You get very sensitive ones that rapidly die off. And what you're left with is persisters. And so people look at it and say, well, how do you study persisters? You know, how do you study something that can't grow or things like that? There's no kind of uh, biomark to say, this is a persister, this isn't a persister. So, as I say, you go to the genetics, and they talk about the toxin-antitoxin theory. You can go to the microscope like Tom Wood would do and say, look, it's got no ribosomes in. That must make it uh, a persister. Uh, we did try lab on a chip uh, where you basically look at individual cells, but the trouble with that, if you've got a million cells, one of those will be a persister. And there was this hope that uh, the diffusion dyes like Cyto9 and PMA PCR, which are based on uh, basically protomotive force, could do it. They don't. You can't tell if a persister is a dead life cell or a persister by using these dyes. And other people say, well, what about respiratory activity, oxygen consumption? Again, it doesn't work. The low, the low metabolism. So a bit like Robert Cox said, yes, the only way you can tell a persister if you revive it, if it can grow. There you are. So we've done some work on it. I won't go through the details, uh, you know, because you get lost in the details. We looked at different systems which could form persisters, and we looked at sprouting seeds, because obviously sprouts and pathogens go together. So we looked at E. coli and sprouts, and we find that if you um, have a population of E. coli on germinating mung beans, they basically reduce the number of persisters. Another half. Well, yeah, what's that mean? And then we looked at indole. So indole is this universal signal molecule, and uh, you know what indole smells like when you've seen it. It stimulates roots, it stimulates root colonization, stimulates Clostridium difficile. But in E. coli, it does the opposite. It inhibits growth, it stabilizes uh, the, all the cell structures like plasmids, reduces its virulence. So it basically makes it into status. And sure enough, when we look at uh, indole, 
it, it does increase the persisters. Uh, so that's good. You know, basically, indole can induce the persisters, and we looked at uh, a sort of defined medium for that. So we looked into the soil, um, you know, basically a homogeneous in this case, and we say, well, does that uh, induce persisters? And a bit like what you just mentioned, it does seem strain uh, dependent. So 0157 and 013, for example, they seem very good at forming persisters in the soil, whereas the other ones, not so much. So what that came, started a theory, and like I said, I'm going into a bit of theorizing now, is that with indole, we believe the only reason it makes more persisters is because it expresses toll C. And toll C is an efflux pump, which has the same, that can basically rid of indole. It can take indole out the cell, and it also can take things like ampicillin out the cell. So basically what the persisters got in this case is increasing the persisters for the simple reason is in inducing this transporter. All right, so that's fine, but let's have another look at persisters because it's quite interesting, you know, when you look at the addition of ampicillin, you know, beta lactamase, to a growing culture. So, you know, the people in persisters, they like a few hours uh, exposure time, you know, because they've got things to do, better things to do. And what we found, though, is when we expose these cells and just leave them for up to 70 days, you get this, not only diphasic, but multiphasic. You get different phases of uh, viability. So essentially, during this time, you can culture the bacteria. Oh, this is hours, not days. Uh, you can culture the bacteria by just plating them on a new plate without antibiotics. But the thing is, that number gets lower and lower with time. So another interesting experiment is to do, well, is it spontaneous? It must be stoichiometric, a proportional to the initial inoculation. So when we looked at this, you would expect a straight line for the simple reason the number of persisters is proportional to the initial inoculation. It doesn't uh, work like that. The lower the actual um, inoculation level, the more persisters. Yeah, another uh, mad <laughs> moment, isn't it? So the thing is, that's interesting. So it's a bit odd uh, that we're kind of formation of persisters. But what about revival? So revival of persisters, really, you, know, you can just take them out the antibiotic stress, no problem, you'll get them to grow. And so what we did is literally got a persister population in the phase four, if you remember back, that's about 40 hours into exposure. And we just had beta-lactamase to degrade the um, antibiotic, and sure enough, they grew. So this, came, this disproved the point about, well, there's a special signal molecule suppressing the growth of persisters. Yeah, because if it was there, just adding an enzyme to degrade it would be, wouldn't be sufficient. So once you relieve the antibiotic stress, that's good. Now, the problem is, though, is that if you start leaving it, the persistent population, beyond about, I would say, five days, yes, suddenly what happens is that it doesn't revive. It basically goes non-cultured. But if you add a, a reagent to it, like methylpyruvate, I won't go into how we got methylpyruvate, it kind of revives the cells to a, a degree. But past nine days, you know, basically it doesn't. So uh, basically we had this model where we had uh, additional antibiotics, kills off the kind of weak cells. Then by removing the antibiotic, you get revival of persisters. But after a certain time, five days, uh, you need that extra revival agent. But after nine days of that, beyond nine days, you can't revive them. They've gone to VBNC. So basically what we're saying is that the VBNC is a continuation of the actual um, persister phenotype. But there's a sort of complex or a paradox, isn't there? You've got these persisters that spontaneously appear in the media. They could grow, but they don't grow. But all you have to do is take the antibiotic stress, and they suddenly said, we're going to grow now. Very odd, very perplexing. So people have looked at revival, because obviously revival is a key thing if you can enumerate persisters. And I've got the five-minute call, so I'm going to go uh, skip a little bit. Uh, but essentially people said, well, I'd pyruvate, uh, you know, basically put them in a tissue culture, be good. The scalp theory, I think, is exactly right in that. There was a, uh, a sort of experiment done over two years where they suddenly found these persisters spontaneously reviving after six, seven months. And that tells you a biological clock. Anyway, so the theory is, oh, this is a new theory, um, 
we haven't got any data for it yet. So persistors are born into this sort of supercoiled uh, format. So they've got toll C, so ready to pump that antibiotic. And what we believe, and like I say, this only theory, is that their DNA gets damaged as much as a non-persister cell does. But the key thing is, is that they can repair that DNA much more effectively. And anyone knows about spore photo products, know about spore revival. I think it's related to that because it's the um, work has been done, the top of isomerase, which untangles DNA, enabling the SOS response, i.e. DNA repair, and it outgrows. And the only thing that distinguishes a persister from a non-persister is a filamentous growth during revival. So that's the only biomarker. Um, so basically, a bit like uh, the previous talk, uh, all right, that's good. It's all nice, fancy science. We're not at uh, uh, the uh, environmental microbiology uh, seminar here. But what does it mean? So what it really means is, is it more resistant? So we've got persisters versus non-growing or non-persisters, which are stationary cells. And we find little differences, you know, uh, very small differences in chlorine, uh, hypochlorite resistance, per acetic acid, thermal. But where the big difference comes is in UV treatment. The non-persisters are much more sensitive than the persister cells, which kind of goes into the theory about DNA repair. And in soil, uh, again, a bit like uh, we identified, you get this decrease. And rather than in broth culture, where you get this sort of declining to non-viability, they kind of go in stasis. And this stasis, I think, is when you revive them that's when they start growing again. And with indole then, uh, yeah, going back to indole, the reason why we think it does uh, keep them in that sort of stasis is because indole suppresses the recovery of persisters in, um, in the soil environment. So is, is dormancy significant? I think you've got to consider it. I think it's just complementing many other stress resistances that you encounter. The reality is persister research is so fragmented, nobody knows what to conclude. Everyone's going on their own methods and things like that. Uh, but certainly, if we have got a concern about them, it is to do with these latent infections. I, we won't know how many outbreaks have been caused by persister cells. But uh, in cancer research, because cancer is persister cells on the uh, eukaryotic level. Their kind of thinking is, let's look at DNA, uh, inhibiting DNA repair and things like that. So I'll conclude there, because I'm definitely out of time. I'd just like to thank the workers, Lara's in the audience who worked on persisters and obviously the financial support for these uh, interesting curiosity of a, a subject. Okay, thanks. Okay.